so we are going to have a panel on international engagement for India's future. And I must uh, thank uh, MR for really putting up this panel together. Uh, MR has been a great partner for really curating this event and curating this session. So India Spora has been a partner here. So MR, thanks a lot uh, for really, really helping us put this together. Uh, so we have a very, very interesting group of people who are actually going to be here on the panel. So we have Naveen. Uh, I, do I see Naveen here? Oh, yes, Naveen, please. So why don't you just join us on the stage? Uh, we, we have uh, Raju. I just met Raju right now. I can see Madhu here somewhere. So Madhu, if you could just be yeah. here. And then, of course, uh, Deepti. Uh, so please, can, I, can we have you up on the stage? And I hope all of I you... I want to do a talk first, if you don't mind. Oh, yes, bring please. Them up. It's your if panel. You... And the only thing is that you have to finish by 425. 425. Yes. Four, you got it. Yes, no problem. thank you. Thank you, Amit. Thank you, everyone. Uh, great to be here. And thanks to Amit and Richard for incredible program. Uh, I just want to spend a few minutes talking about the diaspora, and then we'll get into how the diaspora engages with India and go from there. And we'll take some questions as well. And so uh, we started in diaspora 10 years ago as a nonprofit to bring the diaspora leaders together to be a force for good. So we have doctors, lawyers, academics, artists, you name it. We have people from every part of our community working together to be a force for good. What does that mean? Right? It's easy to say force for good. It sounds like a cliche. But we really want to work together as a group that does things around philanthropy, promoting entrepreneurship, getting the arts and culture together, integrated with wherever we live. So there are many, many facets to what the diaspora does. And I think the diaspora can engage in many, many different ways. So I'm going to pick six areas where the diaspora engages with India. The first one that, being in Silicon Valley, I want to bring up entrepreneurship as the first one. right? Silicon Valley, when I came here in 1982, we had 10,000 Indians, 10,000. 40 years later, it's close to 400,000 Indian Americans. Okay? 40 times growth in 40 years. That's what Silicon Valley has seen because of our presence in the IT sector. Right? So Indian Americans are a little over 1% of the population. We are 10% of the IT workforce. Okay? We're 7% of the doctors. So we are really unfair advantage in many, many different parts of society in the countries we live in, especially the US. Right? So looking at entrepreneurship, how does the diaspora engage with India? The first thing we've done is invest in Indian startups. There's so many venture firms where Indian Americans are partners here. Now they've started venture operations in India. You can look around, whether it's a Sequoia or an Axel or a Nexus or Westbridge or Rocket Ship. I mean, there's so many firms where there are Indian partners and Indian founders and GPs who are investing in India directly or they've opened shop in India, okay? Investing billions of dollars in the Indian entrepreneurship, right? That's one part of the story. The other part of the story, there are a lot of Indian entrepreneurs, and we think in the last few years, it's in the neighborhood of four, 500 of them who have moved from India to Silicon Valley because they run software as a service company, SaaS companies, and these SaaS companies sell to large corporates and you can't sell everything from India to a big business in the US. So Indiaspora is also playing a role by mentoring, advising, and potentially investing in these companies who come to the United States to do business. So there's a very flourishing corridor between India and the US in terms of investment and entrepreneurship. Another area that there's, I think, tremendous cooperation and that is, uh, and we'll be talking about some of this on our panel, is the soft power of India, right? And one of the best examples of that is the Prime Minister made, uh, I think it's June 21st, Yoga Day, International Yoga Day. So last year, yoga was being uh, actually implemented and done on the beach in front of the Golden Gate Bridge. I mean, just think of that iconic picture of people doing yoga in front of the Golden Gate Bridge. Uh, th those are the kinds of things, whether it's Bollywood, it's cuisine. Now in San Francisco, uh, new Michelin star, two Michelin star chefs have opened a new restaurant. You can't even get in, 
uh, to the restaurant. There's a wait list for weeks. Uh, so it's food, it's Bollywood, it's music, it's the arts, and we'll be talking about all the soft power of India and how that is manifesting itself, not just within the diaspora, but within the countries we live in. And so you might say, how many diaspora are there? Uh, and India has the largest diaspora in the world, 32 million people, okay? out of which the big diasporas are, of course, the US, Canada, UK, Singapore, UAE, and Australia. These are the big and most successful ones, but there are many people in the diaspora who are underprivileged or, uh, or, you know, or not as privileged as some of the diaspora. These are countries like Fiji, Suriname, Guyana, Trinidad, Mauritius. There are lots of Indians there who are workers, laborers, blue collar people and stuff who are not as well off as the diaspora in some of the other countries. So again, there's a, you know, different types of diaspora as well that you have to deal with. Uh, the other area that we engage with uh, India is on the climate issue, which came up quite often from Soam and others today. And we have someone on our panel who will talk climate, but I think this is one area where the diaspora can collaborate with India. In fact, at in diaspora, we do a climate day, uh, in diaspora climate summit every year for the past three years, and we're doing one again in April around Earth Day, where we bring Indian Americans interested in climate and climate solutions and Indians in India together once a year, talking about climate. Then we also have philanthropy. One of the big, big objectives and mission of Indiaspora is to double and triple the giving of the diaspora, right? In this regard, Indiaspora has done several initiatives. One is we've created a, a group called the India Philanthropy Alliance. This is a group that was never formed before they thought they were all competitors. So you take the largest Indian philanthropy organizations like Akshay Patra, Pratham, AIF. They thought and viewed themselves initially as competitors because they were going after the same pool of money. But we have brought them together now in a successful group uh, in growing the pie, in growing the amount of money given to philanthropy. And in fact, on March 2nd, you'll see a lot of social media around India Giving Day in the United States. It's March 2nd, and hopefully, You'll be able to go to India Giving Day, the website, donate money, tell your friends about it. It's gathering a lot of steam. And next week on March 2nd, there'll be a big launch and rollout. Much like in the US, we have Giving Tuesday in November, where everybody in the United States comes together and gives money. And it's almost a billion dollars of giving happens in the US in one day. We're trying to make a movement which might result in a few million dollars going to India this, this day, and then much more money in the future. We also have done a joint venture with an organization called Give. Give is the largest giving platform in India. Where during COVID, I think they raised $150 million for COVID relief in India. We've done a joint venture with Give uh, India called Give US, where again, we have uh, been given money by a very generous philanthropist by the name of McKinsey Scott Bezos to really grow the pie uh, of giving between US and India. So we also have a joint venture with them. So these are the different types of activities in Diaspora does. We also have a list of in Diaspora philanthropists on our website and so on and so forth. So again, philanthropy is a big cornerstone. What else are we missing? We have investment, entrepreneurship, philanthropy, arts, we, oh, healthcare, the other area. We have 200,000 doctors of Indian origin in the US. I think I see someone here in the audience, Anurag. Uh, so the 200,000 doctors, so look at the impact this community is making both by doing medical camps in India and helping India. And there was a lot of talk about telemedicine. This is a community, if you can change the liability rules of how someone can practice medicine in India, you could literally have an army of Indian American doctors doing telemedicine to India, and that needs to be worked out. But that could be something in the future that happens as well. And then the last area of engagement is academia, right? People like Amit are visiting and being scholars in the US and so on and others. But keep in mind, there are 20,000 Indian American professors, 20,000. This is an asset that India can leverage. If you can even get 1% or 5% of these people to come 
on sabbaticals to India. That would really enrich the intellectual capability and capacity you have in India. So there's a lot of things we can do as the diaspora in this regard, right? Whether it's healthcare. Oh, by the way, we also have tens of thousands of lawyers in, in the US if you need some in India. We'll be happy to send some of those as well. Very good lawyers. Yeah, we'll keep them here. We won't burden India with that liability. But anyway, so there are many, many aspects to this. Uh, but what I want to do is I want to bring my panelists up now after giving these remarks. And so Naveen, come on up. We, we got four stereotypes who are going to be on the panel. First is Naveen. He's going to be the environmental activist. And really, he is, because he's put his money where his mouth is. He has a company in that space. I'll let him describe that to you. But he's done so much work in trying to solve the climate crisis and make money. Then we have an investor. We have Madhu Ayer here as well. Come on up, Madhu. Madhu is with a venture capital firm that invests in India. And then we have, let's see, who is the third? Raju Reddy is a philanthropist. Oh, there. Raju, come on up. Raju also is investing heavily both in Indian startups as an investor, but he's also a philanthropist. And he'll tell you a little bit more about the sandbox he runs in, in uh, Nizamabad. Yeah. yeah, I got the name right. OK. And then finally, we have the artist. And uh, she's dressed up as an artist. Come on up, Deepthi Mathur is here as well. And she is going to talk about soft power and the art scene and how US and India and, and the arts community works. Come on up, Madhu. I mean. Deeply. So we'll start. Let's start with uh, climate, since sure. that was a topic that we discussed quite a bit. So Naveen, tell us a little bit about yourself. How did you get into the space you're in, and what does your company do? And then we'll go into more detail a bit later. Sh sure, you bet. Thanks, Mr. For having me here. I like that you're calling me a climate activist uh, <laughs> because I'm actually an entrepreneur in the space, and the activists would call me a sellout. Actually. <laughs> Um, so um, first, a little bit of definition. I, I categorize the space I work in as climate tech. And for me, what that means is if you think about the whole carbon footprint of our planet, it comes from agriculture, it comes from transportation, it comes from materials, it comes from all kinds of things. Uh, so any technology that people are working on to reduce that carbon footprint, I consider climate tech. The company I work for, Terviva, the company I founded, specifically works in the food and agriculture space. And what we're doing, um, there is a tree that I'm sure none of you have heard of before. It's called the Pangamia tree. In Hindi, it's called Karanj. And it's an Ayurvedic tree that grows really well on poor quality land, and it produces beans. You can think of these beans as being very similar to soybeans. And this Karanj tree is like a lot of other what we call frontline community crops in the world. They're not the big five crops like soy and palm and corn and rice and wheat. Not the biggest ones, but dozens of other ones that have been used by frontline communities for various purposes over years. So in, in India, the Karanj tree has been used for Ayurvedic medicinal and skincare purposes. So what Terviva has done with a lot of money and a lot of patience, over the last 10 years, we've, number one, shown we can grow this tree on poor quality land here in the US and we can get yields better than the best soybean and palm land in the world. On land where if you tried to grow soybean or palm, you'd get nothing, right? The second thing we've done, as I mentioned, these beans are bitter, they have Ayurvedic usages, but we've uh, developed food processing to expand the usage of the oil and the protein in these beans into all the same types of applications that you see soybeans and palm used, more, used for today. So Terviva is truly a technology company. We're a little bit over 100 people. Uh, and uh, we actually have about 40 people now in India. Just a quick note about India, and then I'll pass the mic over. We'll talk more about climate and, and how I think. I'm very bullish about climate tech in India. Um, uh, the Karanj tree is so abundant in India. It is, because it grows on poor quality land, it grows in the poorest parts of India. So you know, Bihar, Chhattisgarh, Madhya Pradesh, Maharashtra, these types of areas, Jharkhand. Um, we did a little study with McKinsey about a year ago that revealed there's about a million and a half tons of Pangamia beans sitting in this part of India, and only 10% of them are actually actively traded in commerce, right? So we have an opportunity. Rough math, one and a half million tons of Pangamia beans approaches close to a billion dollars of product value per year, and only 10% of that is being captured today. So we have a huge social opportunity to come into these 
climate distressed parts of India where there's a lot of inequality today in India and really uplift those communities. So I'll talk more about why I'm right. bullish on climate tech, I guess, in a little bit. And uh, I was a guinea pig for the oil they make from that. That's thing. right. And I tra tell you, it is actually good oil. Thank you. Used in cooking. Thank so you. I did use it. Thank you. Uh, next up is the investor. So Madhu, tell us a little bit about your background and, and the investments that you do in India. Absolutely. Thank you for having me here, MR. Um, so we, uh, you know, I have uh, an interesting background in that, that, uh, uh, you know, I grew up all over the world uh, and came to the U.S. a long time ago and uh, was in San Francisco uh, for over a decade building startups here. Uh, but because I'd grown up in Singapore, I went back to uh, Southeast Asia uh, and was an investor there and was um, uh, at a company called Gojek, which is uh, the Uber of Indonesia. Uh, and uh, started the Singapore office. Um, we raised $550 million. Uh, I was a chief data officer. I was on the board. Uh, we raised $550 million, became a unicorn, uh, became a decacorn, uh, you know, expanded all over Southeast Asia. Uh, my colleagues just took the company public uh, about a year ago, so it's been a grand success. This was, at a time, this was at a time when India, in 2014, 15, 16, there was not much happening, and it always sort of uh, surprised me because we built a, a thousand person team of technologists in Bangalore. Um, and I was sitting obviously in Singapore. And uh, it was really, uh, Bangalore scene was, uh, was happening, but it was not quite there. It was just the technology shop of the world. Um, and, uh, you know, and that uh, always, uh, I carried that burden in my, uh, in my mind a little bit that what could be done um, differently. Came back to the U.S. Uh, and in 2017, uh, I can tell you uh, that, um, uh, you know, there were not too many people in the valley who wanted to be investing in uh, any other place other than the Valley and perhaps New York and a few other places in the US. Um, and that was, uh, that was uh, challenging and I started a fund of my own uh, and uh, raised some money and uh, decided that I had to um, always pursue global uh, investing. Uh, I was a big believer in Asia, big believer in the fact that you know, there's just a lot a uh, lot more happening outside the, the valley and the bubble here. Uh, and uh, I met, uh, as I was investing, I met uh, uh, my, the founders of Rocketship, and, uh, uh, and uh, you know, now I'm a managing partner there. Uh, and they were the only ones, other than me, or, and a few other handful of us, uh, who were global investors. And uh, we use data to invest in companies all over the world. Uh, and what really heartened me is that in 2017, 18, 19, we had begun to find, in, through our data, uh, we had begun to find India peaking. Uh, and we really didn't want to, we, so we picked up the phone and, uh, you know, in fact, called some Indian investors and uh, entrepreneurs, uh, Indian investors that we knew, saying, do you know these companies and why are they being picked up in our data? And nobody had a clue then. And 2019-20, we were there in India. We were big investors. We had investors in Khata Book, in No Broker, in uh, Moglix, in a, in a bunch of companies in India. And, uh, and it's just getting stronger. So we do B2B, we do B2C, SaaS, and we also are now looking at deep tech. Uh, and we have invested in a company called Agnikul in India, which is India's first private space startup. Uh, and uh, there's supposed to be a launch uh, soon happening. And uh, we're also invested in a company called Urava Labs, which is uh, synthetic water. Uh, and so India really is uh, a place now that is becoming the world's deep tech uh, you know, startup place as well. So we are very excited and very bullish uh, in climate tech, in deep tech, and in many other uh, you know, arenas in India. Thanks, Madhu. Uh, Raju. Raju was an entrepreneur in Silicon Valley, ran his own company for, what, 20 years, and then uh, exited, and now he's an entrepreneur again in some ways and a philanthropist. So uh, talk a little bit about what you've done, sure. Raju. Sure. All right. Thank you, Amar, and uh, great to be here uh, to see so many familiar faces. Uh, yeah, like Amar said, I think you said you came here 82? 82. 82. Yeah, so I came about two years after that. And I started my journey uh, as, uh, you know, as, as a, uh, uh, straight out of college as an employee at Intel. After about 10 years, uh, that's when I started my company, Sierra Atlantic, and uh, grew that uh, over 17 years to be a sizable company, about 2,400 employees worldwide, 
with most of the employees, uh, you know, uh, the three largest places of employment was India, China, and uh, here in US. And uh, 2010 is when Hitachi bought my company. And uh, after that, for the last 12 years, uh, I've been very active, engaged with India. I would say there are two main areas of personal interest for me as it relates to India. One, the product companies coming out of India, to some extent what Madhu was talking about, I share that enthusiasm and that uh, you know, optimism for India. Uh, product companies coming out of India, building for a global market. In some ways, I believe India is in a unique position to combine the best of both China and Israel. China is in a large domestic market, you know, uh, and startups addressing the domestic market. Israel, one could argue, is one of the most vibrant startup ecosystems outside of the U.S., building products for a global market. And uh, so that's an area of personal interest for me uh, because this is where I live. While I go to India very often, pretty much for the last 30 years, I would say, since I started my company, uh, Sierra Atlantic back then, uh, I've been going back almost every three months. Uh, I just came back about two weeks ago after a seven-week stay in India, which is my longest in the last uh, 30 years since I came here. And uh, so I'm very excited about the prospect of some of these uh, entrepreneurs, uh, at least from the ones that I see, they are just comparable to the best that we see in Silicon Valley. The quality of the entrepreneurs, most of them are young, first-time entrepreneurs coming from middle-class families. So that I believe the downstream impact of that is going to be very uh, substantial. Uh, you mentioned Agnicol, there is a similar company, in the same space, there's another company called Pixel. You might be familiar with that, Ave Samad, just extraordinary entrepreneur. I truly think he's one of those sort of once in a generation kind of entrepreneurs, right? Uh, building a space tech company, uh, you know, that's uh, doing hyperspectral imaging. Uh, so anyway, not going, I don't want to go too deep into that, but that's one area of personal interest. The other one is uh, what MR referred to, the sandbox model of economic development. This is basically, everything we do there is about improving income level in rural India. So we pick a close-knit geography, I'll talk more in detail later, but work in that area, roughly about 10 million population. Uh, so this is modeled after the work that Desh, Desh Pandey, some of you may know uh, about him, uh, he has done a lot of work in that area in Hubli. In fact, we had an active program uh, with Stanford. Uh, some of the students came as uh, you know, summer interns, spent time there. Even some of the PhD students came there and built a chili dryer machine. So there's a lot of engagement, I think, where back to the kind of the topic about international engagement for India's future. I, I do think there are a lot of synergies between India and the US, and uh, you know, whether it's in philanthropy or building startups or the global markets. Thanks. Thanks, sir. Deepthi? What do you do? Uh, all right, so I'm a lapsed biochemist is how I like to introduce myself. And um, my training, my PhD in biochemistry has equipped me splendidly for what later on became a career in South Asian art. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, just kidding. I, I've had a few good mentors along the way. Um, I'd say most of my interests currently lie in the area of working cross-nationally, both India as well as, uh, and the regions in the subcontinent, not just India, and within the US, um, on really advocating for contemporary, modern and contemporary Indian art, South Asian art broadly. Um, so I work with uh, a couple of museums, and I've served on the board of several museums over the last 20 years or so. And currently, I'm on the board of the Asian Art Museum. Um, but a real passion of mine is education. And I work bi-coastally with Harvard on the east and Berkeley on the west on advancing the study, um, the scholarship in South Asian visual culture really quite broadly. Um, so that is. Um, kind of what I'm doing. I also help build um, you know, with friends, including one in the audience today, Asha, um, some of the collections or holdings of South Asian art in the major museums of the world. Uh, with Asha, we collaborated on um, a couple of objects that are currently in the Met Museum. Um, other museums that I've been involved with are Asia Society Museum, the Asian Art Museum, Seattle Art Museum, the list is long. but. Um, that those are kind of the things I'm doing. So really trying to advance the study, the understanding, the display of 
visual culture of our region. Um, you know, if we feel we are not represented adequately in the leading institutions in the country we have chosen to talk, you know, to adopt as our homeland, we have nobody to blame but ourselves, right? So I really feel quite strongly about that and trying to, you know, what I can to move that forward. Absolutely, great job. So again, this is the kind of panel that uh, in diaspora represents, and this is what we want to see happen even at the G20. So one of the things working with uh, Ambassador Harsh Shringla and Amitabh Kant, uh, in diaspora will be doing a G20 meeting in August in New Delhi by bringing the diaspora from the 20 countries mm -hmm. to actually talk about climate change, investment, philanthropy, arts and culture, and how the diaspora can work actively with India itself. So that's uh, coming up in, in August in, in New Delhi, if you are all there at that time. So let's, uh, let's go back to some of these uh, topics here. So to get back to climate, uh, there were a couple of interesting charts that came up earlier in the presentation on actually documenting with temperatures going up one degree, the amount of productivity that was lost and uh, things of that sort, really documenting this extremely well. So Naveen, what do you think? What can be done? Uh, you, you have visited India many, many times. You're working with climate tech companies. What are some of the things that can be done in the short term? Yeah. Um... A couple of observations about what we see on the ground. Um, I was talking to MR and I was saying there's, there's reasons to be very optimistic in my opinion about the, pro the projection of entrepreneurship and innovation around climate in India. Um, first of all, I think there's some progenitors to the 1990s and early aughts technology boom uh, where we saw huge companies being born out of India and becoming global, Satyam and uh, Infosys, Wipro, you know, obviously Tata, like coming global, global household names in this space. I think you could argue some of the reasons why that happened are related to the cultural and educational institutions in India that let that flourish. So those things have only uh, continued, right, in the last two and a half, three decades, right? One could argue uh, have even improved, but then you can layer on top of that um, the demand in India for climate tech itself, right? So again, one could argue that those technology companies also helped build the institutions of technology in India in the early aughts. But when you look at India, of course we see there's gonna be huge climate impacts related to food and agriculture and so forth and so on. One of the things that isn't talked about is how dependent India is for its food supply on other parts of the world, right? So for example, India is a huge net importer of edible vegetable oils. India's largest agricultural balance of trade is buying edible vegetable oils. The vast majority of that imported vegetable oil is palm oil from Southeast Asia. And you probably know palm oil is very destructive to the environment. So there's these interesting sort of nexes, if you will, of um, history of entrepreneurship and innovation, cultural and educational institutions that will support that entrepreneurship and innovation, and interesting demand dynamics that I think are gonna really propel uh, India forward as a climate tech leader um, in, the, in the next you know, sort of couple of decades. One, one more nuance I'll share, Amar, about this. Um, a lot of climate tech is also old school tech. It's food processing, it's infrastructure building, it's electrification. Um, believe it or not, those types of competencies in the US and Europe are not very fluid, right? A lot of large companies that have built infrastructure now many, many decades ago, and of course they made improvements, but we can look here in California at all the issues we've had with our infrastructure to know that it's not quite uh, snappy anymore. If you look at India, and all of the development that has had to happen in food processing and in electrification and in infrastructure, one could argue those private sector actors are more developed in those competencies than what you might see in the US and Europe. So again, I wouldn't be surprised if your Godridges and ITCs and Reliances and Adanis become even bigger in climate tech globally than what we saw happen with your Wipros and, uh, micro, and uh, excuse me, uh, Infosys's and Satyams and, uh, taught us. That's good. So the point of collaboration, uh, Deepthi, coming to you, can we do an art exhibit around climate? I and mean, has that been done to kind of get 
to people viscerally and emotionally? I mean, just to oh, yeah, absolutely. So recently, I was yeah. um, in Delhi for the India Art Fair, and uh, there was this wonderful work by a Nepalese artist um, that was being sh so shown at a gallery called Shrine Empire on uh, photographic works on climate and the impact that is having. Artists have been looking at this for a very long time um, at the Venice Biennale last um, this year. Um, a really important work um, was um, by a fellow called Prabhakar Pajupurte. I'm getting his, pronouncing his name wrong. Um, and it was about, it was about um, the impact that climate change has had on farming and farmer suicides. So absolutely, you know, I think um, climate is affecting everything globally, and artists are so finely attuned um, to these impacts that they are paying more and more attention to it. So absolutely, it is, it is doable. And I do know that, you know, major museums um, like the Kiranada Museum of Art in Delhi um, are going to be doing more work around these issues. Give a shout out to Technology HCL for facilitating the KNMA. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, so Raju, how about you? Uh, talk a little bit more about the sandbox. What really happens, and you know, is climate an issue as well? Let's let's address both. It is. It is. So uh, the central idea of sandbox. Everything we do is about improving income level in rural India. So again, we pick a close-knit geography and work in that area, roughly 10 million population, right? So kind of three main uh, aspects to it. Uh, one, it's a bottom-up form of socio-economic development, meaning unless the local people are an active part of the solution, these changes are not sustainable. It can be somebody sitting in Hyderabad or Bangalore, let alone Silicon Valley. There has to be a lot of local ownership of that. So that's one element. Uh, so a lot of what we do is also about engaging the local youth in you know, some of these things. And second, uh, it's taking an entrepreneur mindset to addressing the social challenge. Meaning charity alone, it's not sustainable. So how do you get the, I don't like the word beneficiary, but I like to call them change makers. Uh, how do you get them to pay for some part of that service? It's not always feasible, but it can be done as long as there's an economic value that you're adding to that process, right? Uh, and I'll give you some examples. There. So that's a very important part of it. Making, because to some extent, while there have been a lot of wonderful government programs over the years, you could also say, you know, that has taken out the incentive, you know, amongst the people for that hard work or whatever. And third is scale. Country of a billion people, uh, Naveen talked about kind of some aspect of that, you know, uh, and uh, you can't really make a meaningful, there are a lot of people doing wonderful work in one village here and there, God help them, it's fantastic, India needs that. But you can't make a meaningful difference unless you touch a large population. So 10 million, so today our impact region is roughly about 1% of India's population, about 13 million I would say. Uh, so the idea is if you have 20 such ecosystems around the country, that's 20% of India's population, and more like 25 to 30% of India's rural population, right? And uh, so we've been at it for about nine years, and uh, uh, we work, uh, I mean 70% of India still lives in the villages and the small towns of India. And agriculture is a very big part of it, and climate obviously has a huge impact there. Uh, I, I'll just give you one example, if I may. Uh, so there is uh, this notion of farm ponds, uh, basically, you know, water shortage for agri is a huge issue. And fortunately, India, it's not like Africa or Israel where there is a big shortage of, you know, rainfall. India, most of India actually is covered with pretty decent rainfall. But we have not done as good a job of harvesting the rain, uh, rain, uh, rain water, uh, rainwater. Sorry. So uh, roughly we take about 5% of the uh, uh, land that the farmer owns. In that we dig a... Uh, a trench like a 50 by 50 by 12 feet or 100 by 100 by 12 depending on the size of the farm. So that costs about anywhere from 60,000 to 1 lakh. Uh, in dollar terms I guess $800 to about $1,200. Uh, and we 
gave 50 to 60 percent of that, and uh, the farmer put in whatever the, about 40 percent uh, to 50 maximum. Uh, we did 7,000 of those farm ponds within one year. Uh, when when I say we gave, that was all philanthropic dollars. Uh, we did 7,000 to demonstrate that model in Telangana and Karnataka, and. Uh, Within one year, the farmer is more than able to double their income and recoup all that investment, right? Now, 7,000 is fine, but again, scale is very important in India. So now we want to do 100,000. 100,000 will cost us anywhere from 600 crores to 1,000 crores. So that's like about, you know, roughly $100 million. So, and that's a pretty large chunk for any philanthropic foundation to put in. But we don't need to, because we have demonstrated the ROI of it. Now we are able to get the large banks, SBI, HDFC, and NABARD, because the banks have the capital, and they're actually looking for good investable you know, projects. So they've seen the viability of this, and they are giving about 80% of that as loan directly to the farmers. And the farmers are putting the remaining whatever 20%. And we are investing another 100 crores, roughly about 15, 10 to $15 million in technology, so we hired a CTO who came from Google Earth right here, Shubha Biswas. Uh, he's not here in the room today, but anyway, here in Mountain View. And because there's satellite data, thanks to all these satellite projects, and you know, uh, every six days you get a complete picture of India's this thing. So using satellites, you can actually apply some good tech to decide where to put the farm ponds and all of that. So that's an example of applying you know, entrepreneurial mindset to addressing social challenges. Uh, and of course, I can speak for a long time about others, but I just thought that'll give you a feel for it. But climate impact is a huge aspect of what's happening with the farmers. So once you have the water harvestation, I think seed varieties is one area where that's coming into play. We're working on that. And yeah. Fantastic. And so Madhu, uh, have you guys made any climate tech investments or looking at that as an area of opportunity? Absolutely. I mean, I think, uh, you know, the one thing that I will say is uh, dovetailing what Raju said about uh, a lot of investability in India. Uh, you know, I, I want to take the room back to um, a structure where investors, uh, you know, have uh, their own investors, which is the limited partners. Uh, and India as a whole has become a really ripe land for uh, LPs from all over the world. Uh, to be interested in, uh, you know, challenges not just in tier one cities and and money making, uh, you know, investments like, uh, like perhaps the Ubers, the Olas, and you know, and so there was the the wave one where it was tier one and it was um, it was B two C and how do you sort of get uh, you know money uh, flowing like Paytm? Uh, how do you get food in you know in tier one cities? Uh, uh, you know, like the um, like the different food startups that came up. Uh, and you know how do you sort of get people from one place to the other, Ola? Uh, and from there, it has now moved. Uh, you know, and then there was edtech, and uh, there was just many areas uh, which were uh, disruptive. Uh, they were just basically, you know, um, uh, waiting to be changed. From there, now we've come to a lot of uh, Bharat apps in the last two three years. And Bharat apps is uh, basically India apps where it is not, uh, it is in the vernacular language. Uh, and and it, it is not just for tier one cities, but it's tier two, tier three, tier four. Uh, you know, you have tier four and five cities as well. Uh, a lot of interest in investing there as well. Uh, and LPs from across the world uh, are wanting to put money in India. Now, there's always been a question in this realm of B2B and B2C uh, of, you know, how do you get, uh, where are the exits in India? Uh, you know, where, where is the IPO market and, you know, and how are we going to get the money back and where is India really headed, uh, you know, just in terms of return. Uh, and so there is that aspect and that's getting solved as well because now we've, uh, you know, we've got a, a, a public market in India that has actually done, fared better in these tough times in the U.S. than most other uh, places in the world. So, you know, that's, that's been established that India has truly arrived. Uh, in terms of climate tech, uh, these are now the important, uh, you know, challenges that um, face, uh, you know, um, at, right from the tier one to tier five. You know, you have farming and uh, and agriculture and all of those problems. Uh, 
uh, which affects everybody, but it's, you know, it's more relevant perhaps to a smaller town, uh, smaller farms and you know, for smaller villages. Uh, but you have EVs and uh, electric vehicles and whatnot that uh, directly impact tier one. Uh, so we're seeing all kinds of investments uh, coming out of India uh, in climate tech. You know, uh, and it is, uh, it's a very interesting place to be because you have ag tech, you know, you have, uh, uh, you know, you have basically the the EV world, and how do we kind of move to electric, uh, and and then you have power and uh, and and power in a very large scale, uh, and so it's it's the gamut, and we have not seen the gamut like ever before that we are seeing now, and so we are really uh, interested in exploring, uh, and it's huge, and there are funds now getting created in India. Uh, that um, you know that are just uh, focused on climate, and that's new also. Uh, and so there is going to be a lot of money uh, getting poured in, uh, you know, which uh, which is really a testament to the fact that India has truly done well and established itself in the other arenas of B two B and B two C. And so the so people know that there is some money to be made. Uh, because that also, you know, that's always a driving factor. Uh, it's not just impact, but it's also commerce uh, and its return and its uh, returns and its money. Uh, but but we think that it's it is uh, it is a sector in itself uh, which is going to be seeing a lot of influx of capital, and we are uh, truly excited. Uh, and we have an advantage that we were in India early on, and India is uh, India is uh, I, I think the and I heard one of the panelists say that India is the best of uh, now Israel and China. I think, Raju, you, you said that, and we see that as well uh, across all sectors. And climate is uh, one of the more interesting ones right now. Right. So Naveen, uh, what does your company intend to do in India uh, over the next, say, five years? What, what do you expect yeah. from India? Yeah, f f I mean, first, is what, what a great discussion here, right? I mean, you can see how all the, you know, the philanthropic capital, the arts, investor capital can really combine to drive forward initiatives. Um, one thing I just want to quickly add, Amar, just to kind of bring the last panel into this discussion too, social progress, right? I think one thing that's really interesting about India, another trend line here, right, is that um, it's a democracy and everybody gets to vote. Uh, and, you know, there's a bigger conversation that we had around that. But businesses in India, you know, when you have GDP growing at 6 to 8% a year, there's a lot of money to be made in a lot of things. Why make sustainably grown food? Just make food, right? Because people need that too. And, you know, that's a hot growing market. Well, what I've seen, you know, to come to your question about what do we do over the next five years, what I've seen is that it's m more important than ever for businesses in India to have the social license to operate, right? So I'll, I'll uh, share a specific conversation in December. I met with the CEO of India's largest vegetable oil company. And in India, that's a big deal, like a lot, very big. And, you know, they're producing somewhere on the order of uh, 5 million tons a year, of oil for the uh, for, for for edible oil for India, just to put it in perspective, in five years my company will maybe be producing fifty thousand tons, right? So point one percent of what they're selling today. So first of all, why would this guy even take this meeting, right? He was probably wondering that too, uh, but. Um, <laughs> You know, uh, obviously he took the meeting. Uh, we were actually introduced, Deepthi, you would find this interesting, by the chief marketing officer of Fab India, because um, uh, Fab India is one of those organizations that's really extended um, the voice, the artistic voice of rural communities forward. And uh, we work with rural communities all over India and some of the poorest parts of India. And he said, look, I need something like this, right? I need to be able to go to, you know, my patrons at the state level governments and at the central government and to be able to say, we are investing in things that are helping, maybe not producing as much vegetable oil as they make today, but are disproportionately helping people that are currently underserved. So I, I want to be at the front edge of that over the next five years. So are we going to be the next uh, largest edible vegetable oil company in India, taking all 1.5 million beans and making it into edible oil? Probably not. Right? But can we find those strategic partnerships at the interfaces of philanthropy and arts and investment to drive a, a different kind of model forward? That's where we want to be. Yeah, please, Raju. Yeah. Uh, uh, there's something that just uh, popped in my head when you started talking about Fab India. So one of the programs we have is uh, called BCA, a Better Cotton Initiative. We are working with about one lakh cotton farmers. And a good part of the funding is coming from um, uh, an organization uh, that is funded by IKEA and H&M and others 
because it's all about reduction of pesticide usage with all of these farmers. So we've been doing that over the last five years and a huge impact uh, on the quality of the crop and everything else. Both the input costs go down substantially, but also the quality of the you know, crop improves. So they're actually able to get better economic value for that crop. So there is absolutely a way to combine the best of the climate objectives and economic incentives for the farmers. But it requires a lot of on the ground work in the villages, going out there and, you know, but can be done. Yeah, Just yeah. something that um, struck me through both of your comments. Um, you know, the Devi Art Foundation in Delhi um, is actually doing a whole bunch of work in villages um, to try and resurrect dying traditions of weaving mm. um, because uh, they are really, really expensive. The material is not good anymore. And they're really starting, you know, again, the ground up through their collaborations, perhaps with organizations such as yours as well, but, um, you know, through their collaborations to try and get back to a better time in the past. Um, so well, that's, a, that's a good thing you bring up, because what if there was an Etsy type company in India or whatever, right, that got all these things going? I don't know if I know there's some products on Etsy available that are Indian made and stuff, but could there well, be... Maybe Madhu will find one to fund. Yeah. You, yeah, well, maybe Madhu can fund it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, and you know we've uh, we've seen a lot of different companies. Uh, you know, as we are speaking about fabrics, uh, we saw a company a while back. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't invest in it, so I won't name it. Uh, but uh, it's a it's a company that is a marketplace for uh, uh, you know trading silk. And silk is a really uh, difficult um, commodity in India. It's very, it's it's very all prevalent. Um, but uh, you know there are there are many different hands that silk goes through. So there is the there are the weavers, there are the growers, then there are the weavers, and then so the ecosystem the chain just kind of goes on. Uh, and the the problem is that there are different communities that are specializing in each set, you know in each of these silos. So the, the traders are, you know, perhaps the Muslim traders. The weavers are perhaps the, 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 the Hindu, uh, you know, certain caste traders. And then the farmers are, you know, and so this is across the diversity of India. Uh, and we have uh, this entrepreneur uh, who is completely sort of obviously, you know, building a marketplace. Uh, and our questions to him were, how are you getting, going to get so many communities sort of across, you know, into one, uh, you know, into one platform? And they did it, and they have done it, and how, uh, you know, it's, uh, and it is, these are the kinds of things that we are seeing that technology is influencing in India uh, beyond anybody could ever imagine. Uh, and, and truly, it is, it goes now beyond things like, you know, it goes beyond anything right now. I mean, in India, I think with technology, you can sol solve most problems, and there are enough competitive, uh, you know, um, companies that are coming up uh, that we are looking at, and this is not a, uh, a silk marketplace uh, is differentiated, uh, you know, as differentiated as perhaps an Etsy would be. Um, but we are, uh, we are certainly looking at it. And some of the companies, so we at Rocketship uh, use, we have the largest startup database. And on top of that, we have uh, multiple machine learning models. And from there, uh, you know, we pick our deal flow. So we are 100% outbound. Uh, and unfortunately, the currency in VC is, you know, you share deals, but we, uh, you know, we have a perspective on our, our own deal flow because it's coming from our data. And um, we find these companies that show up on our uh, technology and platform, like this company, you know, the Silk Company, that we are like, you know, what is this? We don't even know what this is. And one thing we have realized is that we just have to be, uh, we, sh we, we, we should not think we are smarter than the data. The minute we start thinking we are smarter than the data is when we completely fall flat on our face. And so we, um, you know, we just go along with the flow and we just pick up the phone and call these random companies that are solving extremely random problems that are showing up at the top of our screen. And we, you know, it behooves us to call these guys because there is something that's magical happening. And, uh, and that's the beauty of, uh, you know, stuff that's going on in India and all over the world, really. But yeah, India especially. That leads me to the next question, which is more around AI, right? Everybody's talking about AI, chat GPT, all this stuff. What's, what, what is your perspective? Is AI being used, for example, in the sandbox to uncover 
new ways to do things or, Invest. you know, uh, or in, even in the arts, are you using AI to create the next, uh, you know, Hussein? <laughs> yeah, I, I just, uh, yeah. I, I said I was spent seven weeks there and we have this uh, big annual event called Development Dialogue that we bring uh, like about 1,000 people that come there, 300 farmers and, uh, you know, mostly uh, from the villages, communities, and of course, folks from here too. Uh, so after that, one of my guys posted something on LinkedIn about that event. And uh, so I sent it, uh, I saw that note, I said, I sent, sent it to my CEO of the Sandbox who lives in that uh, town, Nizamabad. I said, wow, this is really well written. Uh, who did that? And, and the CEO said, uh, well, it must be this guy from Ronak that uh, is helping us from, you know, from Bangalore. His name is Ronak. And then two days later, he says, no, no, he actually used ChatGPT to write that. So apparent because you know writing skills and that's a very hard thing to find in the rural areas i mean it's hard even metros and all of that but uh, apparently they all have a bookmark with chat gpt now when they write emails and uh, you know the stuff that they put out on social media i know that's not the answer you're looking for but i'm starting to see that uh, certainly percolate but, but one thing that occurred to me is uh, you know in general with a lot of these non nonprofits uh, the two big factors that separate India, I think, and India is just incomparable to any other place in the world, is the scale of the problems they solve and the diversity. And AI, again, has a huge, if you think about algorithms, processing, and all of that. I mean, so many organizations, Akshay Patra, Agasya, Seva, uh, Ekal, that touch 5, 10 million people, you know, and, uh, and the diversity, so many languages. When I go, is, uh, ta ta uh, uh, Tamil is your mother tongue, Telugu is my mother tongue. The scripts are so different yeah. from te uh, Telugu to Tamil. Even the script varies as you go from one state to another, right? The diversity is so rich in India. And uh, so I think any solutions that you find in philanthropy or possibly in the for-profit world too, uh, in India, I think they are very unique, very uniquely positioned to solve the problems of even in America or elsewhere. Just one example comes to mind quickly. I remember Desh, uh, Desh Pandey talked about this. After the Haiti earthquake, uh, you know, Bill Clinton and uh, George Bush, they formed a sort of a ex-president, uh, you know, a committee to rally the communities to support all of that. And uh, so Bill Clinton, uh, you know, his staff heard about the Akshay Patra work, and Desh was the chairman at the time. And they said, oh, okay, let's talk to him. and. Uh, then they called Desh for that, and they said, well, we've got a big problem here in Haiti because we've got to feed like 10,000 meals. And Desh was laughing to himself, each of my kitchens produces quarter million meals every day, yeah. 250,000, right? So that's, when you think about scale, I know Seva works amazingly uh, well in India, but during the COVID time, you know, and they did similar things here in the US also. So the solutions that come out of India, my point is, even with chat, GPT, AI, I think India has some unique things to contribute and we'll probably only find that over the next few years, yeah. yeah. Okay. So do, uh, do you use AI and have you seen AI being used in arts? And um, yeah, stuff? I mean, I think, I think AI in arts is here to stay, yeah. right? We will see some interesting work come out um, and some of it will, which will actually be somewhat original as well. Right now, it is mainly gimmicky. That, that is true even in the US and even in India. Will AI-generated images replace, um, you know, a Frank Stella sculpture? Obviously not, right? Um, but that's not the point, right? I mean, the point is, uh, is it going to influence the way we think about visual media? Yes, it will. Will it influence the creation of it? Yes, it will. Will it become, you know, um, will it occupy a primary, a position of primary importance? Probably not. So that's kind of it. I want to actually get back to India and the scale of India. We've been talking about, you know, the development as aspects of India for a little bit. So I want to talk about one other. You know, we allude, I alluded it to, to it briefly when talking about the KNMA. So, um, you know, this is a museum that is going to be built in Delhi. Um, it's called the Keranadir Museum of Art. Um, it is going to be architected by 
um, a really distinguished architect, David R. J. Um, and it is going to be one million square feet. Uh, that is half the size of the Met. It will be the largest museum in India. And with the exception of the Met, the largest museum in the US. Uh, its budget is going to be larger than that of the Guggenheim, New York. So when we think of India, we think of, um, you know, whatever your poor, weary souls kind of a, a model. That's not necessarily true all of the time. And the impact that some of these organizations are going to have on India, on indeed the soft power of India, which is what we are talking about here as well, you know, every single major institution is going to fall in line to work with them, right? And there are others too, smaller in scale but important, like Abhishek's yeah. museum map, right? But these are all major initiatives that are happening in India that will actually change how we look at India over the long term. I, I'll hold on to my art collection. Yeah, yeah. hold on to your art collection, yes. <laughs> Plus it's well, very nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Naveen? I, I just really curious deeply, is that one million square feet gonna be dedicated to Indian art? Uh, it is going to be dedicated to Indian art, yes. Yeah. Wow. But that will also include public spaces and culture. Mm. You know, it is going to be a cultural center as well. So, um, yes, more gallery space than any other museum in India. And more public spaces, auditoriums, restaurants. Yeah. You know, I think the thinking there is that it should be a place for the community to come and feel welcomed. Mm -hmm. Art is kind of an off-putting thing. You know, people don't know what to wear when they go to visit an art museum in India, right? <laughs> and that's a problem, yeah. right? I mean... Yeah. It's, uh, you know, the elitism of that entire enterprise is something that needs to be abolished. Yeah. MR, just yeah, a quick, quick example of yeah. uh, AI and machine learning in the agriculture sector in India. So I'll go back to the palm story to continue the thread. So obviously the Indian government doesn't like for balance of trade reasons that, you know, 60% of the edible vegetable oils come from overseas. Palm is the biggest form. You can grow palm in India. It grows poorly the uh, largest grower, the, pretty much the only organization working on palm in India is Godridge. So uh, Prime Minister Modi launched a huge initiative to try to grow more palm in India. It was a big announcement about six or nine months ago. So um, in India, there's no corporate farming, right? You have, uh, you know, 35% of India is involved in farming. That's hundreds of millions of people. Um, so Godridge, what they have built, uh, actually around Andhra, Telangana area, Raju, is uh, uh, an AIML platform uh, to help farmers grow palm better. And of course, that platform needs to look pretty different than what a you know, chat GPT uh, would look like here. Right? It has to sort of be accessible on a WhatsApp platform. It has to be very actionable, um, multilingual, uh, multimodal. Um, and so uh, it's happening. You know, I mean, you see these technologies really adapting to sort of so social benefits and uh, into the agriculture and food sector. We have time for a couple of questions. Anybody? Oh, Anurag, and then back there. Oh, oh we'll start. The mic went over there. Thank so. you. <laughs> yes. My name is Walter. Uh, I'm from the SLAC, uh, Stanford India Accelerator Center National Lab. Now, uh, we have a wonderful panel uh, with fantastic uh, background and activity. Now, we talk a lot about uh, green energy. Green energy means a carbon emission zero energy generation. Now, uh, I would like to ask panel, is there any such an investment activity or ongoing activity in India regarding green energy? Because it has a very uh, strong impact on the climate. So talking about clean energy investments right. in India. Right. You want, uh, uh, who wants it? Yeah. yeah. I can talk, yeah. Go, go ahead. Um, I'll add, yeah. I think it's a nascent area in India uh, in the sense that um, well-defined, uh, but uh, just I'm talking about investments now. Uh, and we are seeing a, uh, a nascent but a really ripe area that we have started seeing more and more companies coming, uh, uh, you know, coming out now. Uh, and uh, there is a lot of government, uh, and I think this government is very strong in sort of initiate uh, the you know incentivizing, um, incentivizing these startups, and that's a huge thing. Uh, and once you have that incentivization come from top down, 
then really the magic starts. Uh, and we have seen in the last three, four years uh, that really sort of coming up. And, uh, and more and more, uh, we've not made any personal investments there, so I can't talk too much. But in, just in terms of what we see in the data, absolutely yes. Uh, and it has been very, very heartening to see the Indian government uh, you know, sort of supporting these uh, initiatives, which is very difficult. Now, of course, India has a lot of traffic, and that is, uh, you know, the one thing that we are seeing more and more things coming, uh, you know, coming through. Um, but then there are other realms as well, as I was saying, power and 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 just across the board. Uh, you know, we, we are we're going to. And I was talking about more and more funds being established. So there is a lot of money, there's a lot of government uh, sort of incentivization. So it's all stacking up properly uh, for, the, uh, you know, for the, um, the ecosystem to really have a massive growth. And that inflection point, and which is why I said nascent, that inflection point is right now. Uh, and so you, know, you will hear a lot more. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead, Rajiv. You can ask. Uh, I, I, I'll, I'll give uh, uh, two specific examples. Uh, the company that I mentioned earlier, Pixel, Exactly. Uh, it's positioned as the health monitor for the planet. It's a company now U.S. incorporated, but came out of India. And uh, so they can take pictures at a five meter resolution today. That's the most advanced in the world by any private company. Uh, apparently the closest to that is a Chinese company called Zuhai, I think, that used to take a 10 meter resolution. So the, the idea is now you can detect methane gas emissions anywhere on the planet. So that's a solution, not just for India, but anywhere in the world, right? Uh, so that is Pixel coming out of India, again, funded by, you know, Lightspeed and others, uh, traditional VCs that we know in Silicon Valley. Uh, another example of uh, a company which is uniquely for India is uh, a company called Race Energy. Uh, this, they built swappable battery network, and they... Their aim is to become the world's largest swappable battery network. For the, so they're actually taking existing auto, auto rickshaws, I don't know what you call auto rickshaws, but it's like a scooter, three-wheeler, uh, that's commonly used in cities in India. And that, uh, you know, retro, they're basically fitting, uh, taking the existing petrol, diesel engines and turning them into EVs. But their belief is, uh, Regular EV model will not work because a lot of these auto rickshaws, where they live in their homes, there won't be a place to plug in, uh, you know, into electric outlets and all of that. So what is more practical is to have a swappable battery. Uh, so again, that's a uniquely India kind of a solution. I'm sure that would apply to other places like Brazil and others. So I think there's a lot of innovation coming out of India. And these are all, again, back to the point we were making earlier, young first-time entrepreneurs, it's extraordinary, at least from you know, the, my vantage point, they're as good as the best entrepreneurs I've seen in Silicon Valley. You know. That was not the case 10 years ago, but I think that's starting to happen now. Yeah. Actually, uh, our company, you, uh, one of our portfolio companies, Yulu, uh, does exactly that, battery swaps, and it's an electric yeah. uh, vehicle, and they're, they're actually going out to Southeast Asia and to oh, yeah. Dubai and to other places. And so India is now becoming a hotbed of startups that is taking its uh, technology to the world. Yeah. Uh, and that is, again, another, uh, you know, um, uh, another innovation. Um, I think we're going to see that impact as well very soon. And Ra just kudos, MR, for a great panel here. Amazing panel. I have a question for everybody. I'll, I'll ask only one, though. Mm -hmm. And that, too, towards the end of the conference. So it speaks to the quality of this conference. Uh, the question is for you, um, uh, Deepti. Uh, I come from Raipur. I grew up in Raipur, uh, which is in Chhattisgarh, uh, tier three city. Uh, there's, a, there's an art there called Dokla art, which is by uh, tribals. Um, uh, every time I go to Raipur, I bring back that art to give gifts to, to my friends. But I realize that there is so much of diversity of art, uh, tribal art, especially across India. And only folks who are from those parts of India know about it. Um, are there uh, commercial enterprises, and maybe I don't know if you've seen uh, Madhu, uh, investable opportunities like that, that are actually in the business of bringing uh, th that sort of art for the mainstream market here in the US and the other parts of the world? So I don't exactly know about the United States, and I certainly don't know about any investable companies in that space. But there are organizations mainly um, in the not-for-profit space that work with um, 
you know, tribal artists. Um, and in fact, now major museums um, that have a more contemporary twist, um, certainly, you know, Kiran's museum, certainly Abhishek Podar's museum, they are starting to think really of reframing the discussion about tribal art as just losing tribal and saying art. It's just art um, from other regions, right? So, um, so that is happening, and that is getting them greater exposure. Um, but uh, I think uh, apart from some smaller nonprofit initiatives, I'm not aware of a larger one. I don't know. Do, do you know anything? Yeah, but again, you know, small, right? Um, we have two companies back home. So, uh, I'm a Stanford GSB student uh, currently studying here, and we run two companies. Uh, Handlooms.com is actually owned by us, and uh, we bought 100,000 artisans from all across India mm. for the first time online. And with my second company, which was founded by my father, it's 42 years old, and we've been working with 10,000 artisans all across the geography of India and Indian handlooms. And this is actually a plug for me to say, because I'd be speaking about Indian handlooms at Stanford GSB next month, which will be uh, in the history of Stanford University for the first time, who's speaking about Indian handlooms. And my argument is, whatever is wrong with fast fashion today, we have a solution. We have a solution back home in India. And actually, I want the world to start focusing on Indian handlooms and want to start explaining them that these are textiles. And textiles can take any shape or form, color, that the world requires. And we have capacity and capability to do that. Yeah. Thank you. That's wonderful. Excellent. <laughs> I, I see Amit staring at me, so I think <laughs> I'll. <laughs> Is there any more questions? or? Okay, I think, I think we'll keep you on time, Amit. And I want to really thank this panel. It was fantastic. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.